I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and I'm delighted to see all of you here with us this afternoon. Um, it's a particular pleasure to see so many familiar faces, and I'm also um, very honored to be able to give a special welcome to some people who are here with us today. We have the U.S. Representative, Debbie Dingell. We're delighted to have you here. Yay. We also are joined by Regent Emeritus Neil Nielsen. Yay. Great to have you here. And we have the University of Michigan's Vice President for Government Relations, Cynthia Wilbanks. Welcome, Cynthia. I'd like to thank Tom Avaco and the Close Up team for sponsoring today's Policy Talks event. We're very grateful to them as well. Well, while this event is the last in our policy talk series for this semester, and I'm sure you'll agree with me that we're ending on a very high note, we do have a number of exciting events that are planned for winter term, and so we hope to see many of you back here with us for some of those events as well. Well, today's event will be a conversation style discussion that is hosted by our very own faculty member, Congressman Joe Schwartz. Congressman Schwartz is a U.S. Navy veteran who also served with the CIA in Laos and Vietnam. After serving in the Michigan Senate from 1987 until 2002, he represented Michigan in the U.S. House of Representatives from 2005 to 2007. And now, in addition to his medical practice in Battle Creek, he lectures on Congress and state legislatures here at the Ford School. Thank you, Joe, for all that you do here for us. Yeah. Well, Congressman Schwartz will delve more deeply into our guests' experiences while they were in office shortly, but I would like to share a very quick word about each of their distinguished service before we get started. After serving two terms in the Michigan Senate, Congressman Rogers was elected as a Republican from Michigan's 8th District to the U.S. House of Representatives in 2000. He served on the Energy Committee, and in 2011, he became chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, a position that he held until his retirement from public office earlier this year. Reflecting on Chairman Rogers' tenure, former Speaker of the House, John Boehner, said, by being tough but fair, he has navigated the toughest issues we face while commanding the respect of colleagues and the intelligence community. Congressman Camp was first elected to public office as a member of the Michigan House in 1989. And then in 1991, he was elected to the U.S. House, where he served as chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee from 2011 to 2015. He introduced one of our country's most comprehensive tax reform proposals, the Tax Reform Act of 2014, which, as many of you know, is also known as the Camp Tax Reform Act. And while the Camp plan did not pass, it is considered by many to be an invaluable guide to our, our country's future tax reform efforts, and I think is well known to many who are here in this room. Chairman Rogers and Chairman Camp, thank you both for your service and for traveling to Ann Arbor to join us for this conversation today. We're delighted to welcome both of you here. So just a quick note about today's format. Um, beginning around 4.40 p.m., our staff will start collecting cards. You should have received them when you came into the room today. Um, and then together, Professor Rick Hall, together with Ford School student Therese Empey and John Lynn, will facilitate the question and answer session. For those of you who are watching online, please tweet your questions into us and use the hashtag policytalks. So with no further ado, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Congressman Joe Schwartz. Thank you, Dean. Uh, it, it really is a, a, a great pleasure and an honor, and it's a lot of fun, too, to be uh, uh, back with uh, Mike Rogers and an old buddy. Uh, I won't recount any of our escapades at Lansing, but uh, nevertheless, and Washington, but nevertheless, we have been friends for many years. The same with Dave Camp, uh, a distinguished member of the U.S. House, whose office uh, in the Cannon Building when I was there was just around the corner, and Mike's was just up the hall uh, in, on the same floor, I think, in the Cannon Building, as I recall. Uh, so they are, they are good friends. They're good guys. 
they were distinguished and productive members of the U.S. House. So with that, I would like to start with, uh, it's not necessarily a question, but I would like you to observe, both of you, uh, the, the happenings uh, in the United States House of Representatives, uh, let's say in the last 10 months since you left, uh, how, how it has affected the House, how it's affected the ability of the House to get the job done, how it has affected the ability of the House to choose its leaders, uh, and how it has affected the, the uh, view of the House, shall we say, uh, that the American people have. In other words, can the House, is the House still an effective legislative body? Dave? Well, thanks for that easy question. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, it's, it's certainly been a, a, a challenging few months for them. Um, let me just say that a, a, you know, a group of people figured out that with 29 votes, the majority is no longer the majority. And normally those issues are resolved in caucus. You vote for your leaders in caucus, then you link arms and you go forward because you have the opposition. Um, but they took this fight really potentially to the floor. And when this happened over the summer, I was looking on that and I thought, well, why doesn't the speaker just bring that to a vote and vote it down? That's how you deal with something like that. Well, clearly there was a reason why it didn't come to a vote because it might not have been voted down. And this sort of sat out there all of August and then ultimately I think the threat of a potential um, government shutdown really caused him, the speaker, the current, the, the former speaker to do the right thing, which was to resign and thereby open the way for this two-year budget agreement that really has sort of taken some of these, these issues off the table. But it is a very, uh, I think, a destructive thing, and I think it would have been very unfortunate for the Republican brand, if you will, um, to have had that government shut down, which would have impacted not only the Senate, U.S. Senate races, but also the presidential campaign. So. You know, that is just a very different model than certainly when I first started there, where there was, a, a, you know, a, a certainly a greater deference to the leadership that was elected and also to the committee process and the committee chairs. But having said that, um, and many members of the Freedom Caucus I've met with individually on tax reform. They're very interested in doing tax reform. And I think uh, in other, when we had the majority the other time, when I was in Congress, um, it was it was also a challenging time. But we, you know, we always felt like we were kind of doing big things. And I think this sense that nothing's happening and nothing's moving forward is building up this incredible not only frustration in the Congress but clearly with voters. And so I do think that you're going to see um, an attempt at articulating a an agenda and and trying to work toward that agenda. And I, to, you know, as Paul Ryan said we want to go from the opposition party to the proposition party. And I think that really the power of ideas are what members are wanting to do. And I, I saw this as I worked on tax reform with Senator Baucus, who was my Democrat counterpart on the, at that time on the Senate Finance Committee. And we had a lot of meetings with both senators and, and, and House members on and off our respective committees. There's this, there's this incredible desire to legislate from both parties, and a very, a very huge frustration because there's a sense that that isn't happening. And so I do think that you're going to see a shift to, you know, the committees working even harder and trying to do more. So I think that, that this brinksmanship where it's all about is it debt limit or is it, is it, you know, funding the government, I think there are also other ideas that need to be, you know, brought forward and debated and vetted. And, uh, I, I'm hopeful that we'll have, we're sort of moving into another phase and hopefully they've stared into the abyss and seen that that isn't necessarily a productive way. It doesn't necessarily help you move issues forward. But there are sincere views that we're not doing enough about our debt and deficit among uh, some members and uh, that's where I think this is really being driven, so. Michael? Uh, I mean, I think it's been toxic, and that's probably not good for the country as a whole. And I don't think it's just Republicans adding to that recipe. But uh, if you looked around the world, and I've traveled around the world, I know Dave has, and I know you did a, a lot as a member as well, it doesn't reflect well on our democracy. We are supposed to be the leading democracy in the world, and that dysfunction, I think, is not helpful. So it starts there, and it certainly gets closer to home. And parties, we have to remember, are coalitions. Both parties are made up of coalitions. Uh, there's no monolithic 
individual that you would find in either party. And sometimes those coalitions rise up to, to different to views and opinions and positions in, again, in both parties. And I think what we found was, and what shocked me I think most about the last 10 months, is when they came out with the list of demands, this 29 members that Congressman Camp was talking about, it, was never, it wasn't about an issue. It wasn't about debt. It was, it was about a process question, which tells me that they didn't like the way the speaker negotiated the deal. Right? If you're a legislator and you don't think you're going to negotiate a deal, you probably should not be a legislator. Uh, that's exactly what the duty calls for you to do. Right? You have to sit down with somebody you likely disagree with and come to some conclusion to move something forward. That's the whole nature of being a legislator. Uh, and that's what I think shocked me, and I think that was adding to the acrimony of it, is because if you, you, they were never happy with any solution. If you got 80% of what you want, would you take the deal? No. 90% of what you want? No. 95% of what you want? No. Right? That's not healthy to democracy, and I don't think it's helpful to, healthy to the legislative branch. I'm, I guess I'm a Reagan Republican in that, where he said, I'll take the 80% deal any day, and I'll get up tomorrow and work for the other 20. Right? That's just the way you push forward the things that you believe in, and that part was missing. And I'm very hopeful with the new speaker, candidly, that we can get rid of some of that acrimony. He comes in with none of that baggage of all of the old fights and all of the old disagreements. I think he'll have a fresh face and a fresh start. He's wickedly smart, uh, and I think he likes the idea of the notion of trying to bring people who disagree to come to a conclusion to get something done. So I, I, I'm an optimist, but in politics, you pretty much have to be an optimist these days if you're going to survive. The Republicans have a 23-24 vote margin over the Democrats in, in the U.S. House now. Election coming up next year. Uh, who knows if they're going to hold that, how much of it they're going to hold, how big it's going to be. The bigger question is, do you think that this Congress and its members, uh, both Democrat and Republican, are going to be able to kind of retrain themselves, reset, and be able to work across the aisle on some issues that really need uh, to be looked at, uh, things like taxation problems that need to be solved, defense budget, things of that nature, that, that, that really are going to need some work, but it's going to take a bipartisan effort. Is that possible, Dave? Well, you know, I think it is, but, you know, I think as we talk about sort of the deal, I think the way you build consensus, though, is to actually have the committees do their work, where you actually have people come in in a public forum and testify and sort of fashion issues and deal with issues, and then you're ready to do the compromising. But you can't, I think, just jump to the end game without having sort of all this background work. And a big difference is there's really a relatively new Congress. I mean, there's a lot of newer members um, in terms of, not necessarily young in terms of age, but in terms of time in Congress, both in the House and the Senate. And I think one of the things that um, is gonna be important going forward is that they actually do reinvigorate that. And then I think, I am encouraged if, if they do that, then you'll, you'll have to find a way, because look, nothing big gets done, I think, very well without the best ideas from both parties. And I tried to incorporate ideas that Democrats had in the tax reform draft that I used. Obviously we had working groups and bipartisan meetings and things of that nature to try to do that. Because look, you, you, you know, nobody has a corner on all the good ideas, even though we like to think we do. But that's how you get through a process where there's divided government, where, you know, yes, there's a Republican House, but they don't have 60 votes in the Senate, so you're gonna need Democrat support to move anything in the Senate. And, and there's a Democrat president, so you're, you're gonna need to find ways to do that. And I, there are opportunities. I, I felt very good about the direction Max Baucus and I were trying to go. Um, you know, they promoted him to be ambassador to China, and that kind of ended sort of the partnership in terms of moving that forward on, on tax reform. But a lot of groundwork's been done. They're going to do more, and, and I think the new speaker is going to really empower the committees. So while 16, I, I don't see a lot of legislating getting done in terms of presidential signature, I do see important background work being done on a number of issues that then can be a foundation uh, going forward, because they will, really will defer to the candidates once we turn the corner on the first of the year. And because of the change in leadership, I think the rest of this year is going to be all they can do to sort of finish this highway funding and finish the appropriations bill, whether it's an omnibus or whether it's a continuing resolution. I think those are going to be the things that finish this year. 
But next year, I think, will actually be a very active year at this sort of, uh, not necessarily the you know, press release level, but at the committee level. Mike? Yeah, I agree with that completely. You may have some one-off issues that you can get at in a bipartisan way in both the House and the Senate, but there'll be smaller issues rather than the big issues that face the country. And I completely agree with Dave. If, if hopefully we serve next year to put those folks in a room and start working through really hard, difficult issues. You're never gonna solve the social security issue without putting everybody, all the players in a room, not every, you don't wanna put all 400 in a room, that's always a bad idea. <laughs> but you are gonna wanna have those folks in a room starting to work through their problems. So it's always best by the end of the first months if you can identify where your differences are so you can start bridging those differences. And it takes a long time, it, it sounds easy, it's a complicated yeah. thing. So I, I agree, completely agree with Dave. Small issues that'll happen next year. The big major issues, we're not gonna see anything. I don't even think it make it to the president's desk. Yeah. Mike, this one's for you and uh, you know it's coming. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> the, uh, you, you, were, you were the expert and the chair uh, on matters of intelligence uh, the U.S. intelligence establishment, uh, the last four to six to eight years uh, that you were in the Congress and chaired the Select Committee on Intelligence uh, for four years. Uh, we read a lot and we see a lot about our intelligence community. Uh, I was a proud member of that community so many years ago, you don't even want to count them, but nevertheless, I'm proud of that service. Uh, but we see a lot of things about Chinese intelligence service, the Russian intelligence service. We work with the intelligence services of our, of our allies, uh, the UK, uh, the French immediately come to mind, the Canadians, uh, without you know, uh, uh, doing anything that would be considered breaking the vow to not divulge any classified information. Uh, could you give kind of a view from 20,000 feet of what you think the condition of the American intelligence community vis-a-vis -vis other countries' intelligence communities might be. Yeah, I think the biggest change I saw in the <clears throat> 10 years that I was engaged in, the, in those issues in Congress was the capabilities of our adversaries were increasing, uh, and in the last five years, increasing exponentially. So their, their capabilities, meaning uh, how can they pull off an operation to steal a secret from the United States, either a business or a government secret, their operations got much better. Uh, and I will tell you that, and I think that most people find this shocking, uh, they are overwhelming us with numbers. So we have more uh, now SVR, or which you would know as the KGB uh, agents operating in the United States than we did at the height of the Cold War. We have more Chinese espionage operations being conducted in the uh, United States uh, than we have ever seen in history. And we, we, we weren't used to having two large adversaries operating at the same time. Uh, and so the one thing, I, I think our capabilities are great. I think the patriots who sign up and do this really hard and difficult and, and sometimes slow work uh, are phenomenal. I, I think the people coming into the intelligence services are really remarkable. The, our problem is, are we configured to, to do a, what is now a two-front war, if you will, on intelligence by sheer volume? And then you add to that the capabilities of countries like Iran getting much, much better. Uh, and there are, and even North Korea, we see some activities that five years ago, if you'd have told me that North Korea could pull off a successful cyber attack and take down, almost take down an American company, I, I would have snickered. You know, it's still a country with about a third of their people get electricity seven days a week, 20, uh, 24 hours a day, was able to do that. Uh, the, the rapid change in all of that is really quite concerning. P again, capability is good. I think our efforts are good. It's now how do you deal with the sheer volume of effort targeted against the United States? Very quickly, which, which countries would you say, uh, the intelligence services of which countries, would you say are the strongest and most reliable allies of the United States? Um, I think you have to go right to the five I countries, uh, Great Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, they've been with us forever. We have, we uh, operate jointly. We have complete visibility and transparency uh, from what they do 
to a, a very large degree. I'm sure everybody keeps a little bit in the drawer, as they say in the intelligence business. Uh, but we have this really robust sharing, and it's important if you want to be able to, we don't have the resources, we need our allies to step in with their resources. I would argue those are our strongest, most reliable allies. Thank you. David, uh, your specialty, taxation and all of the things that, uh, that surround it. Uh, would you care to comment on the whole phenomenon that we're seeing now of offshoring and how that's affecting the American economy, American tax receipts, et cetera, et cetera? Well, we're really out of step with the rest of the world when it comes to our tax policy, and particularly with regard to our system of taxation. We're the only large economy left with what we call this worldwide system which means in order for profits earned overseas to come back, there's a double tax pay. No other nation, really large economy, does that. And it's been a change over the last several years. We're also the highest statutory rate in the world and the second highest effective tax rate in the world. So we, what really has been happening is not so much inversions or, or um, you know, profit shifting, but Foreign companies have been buying U.S. companies. We're a takeover target uh, because uh, it's a pretty dramatic change. Other nations have been very aggressive about changing their tax laws, um, and now we face this challenge from the OECD BEPS. So I think we, we really do have to, to make a change here. Um, you know, our, our, our uh, business tax code was changed in 86 under President Reagan, but the international tax laws basically date back to the 60s. Clearly, the ability for ideas and people and money to move around the world in a moment's notice have changed dramatically since that time. There are many other viable uh, countries to invest in besides the United States. And what the concern is, is in the future, not so much that all of Silicon Valley will be uprooted and placed in some European country, but that the innovation, the growth, is going to take place outside the United States. And that is actually a big concern. So what you really want is U.S. companies that are platformed here in the United States that do business around the world are able to do so on an even playing field. And right now we are at a significant disadvantage. So. That has actually caused some bipartisanship to break out in the Congress. The Senate, Senator Hatch, the chairman of the Finance Committee in the Senate, created a working group on international taxation with Senator Schumer from New York and Senator Portman from Ohio, and they issued a joint report where they basically both agreed that we needed to change to a, what we call a dividend exemption taxation system and find a way to have this money that's stranded overseas because of the double tax, more than $2 trillion, has a way to regularly come back to the United States to be invested here. And it, 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 you know, it's a challenging time for that sort of bipartisanship. I know Senator Schumer got some criticism on it. I know Senator Portman did. But clearly, they've, they've seen a path forward. I you know, worked on, that was in also HR1. We needed to do that. And it was great to see that there's some of that coming out of the Senate as well. Um, it's very important that we move forward on that. Here's one I would really like to hear your opinions on. Are you sure? <laughs> I think I would. Uh, Citizens United, repeal or not repeal? Mike? You know, I, I think that uh, transparency is important. I, I worry and I oppose the, uh, the original law that got us to that in the first place. And I wasn't, and I got a lot of heck for that uh, in the beginning because I was very worried about the money that is in politics creeping to outside groups of which you have no idea who they are. Um, and you, you, whoever comes up with the most clever, cutest name wins, right? Because that's what's left on your answering machine. Uh, and you have no way of really getting in and finding out who is that. So I, you know, maybe I'm a little old fashioned in that way, but when I saw a Republican ad and it said paid for by the Republicans, at least the viewer can go, nah, you know, it's the Republicans, I get that. Or the same with the Democrats. We extract, we took a lot of money away from the party system and put it into, into these third party groups. I think at the, at the least we should do is reform this thing. And I do think transparency helps. You should know who is giving money to these organizations that are impacting and influencing politics? I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm not big on the, the, the uh, 
saying you can only give X or Y or Z, but transparency to me is the best cleaner in all of this, and I think it cleans it up. So I, I'm a little worried about where it is. I think we can reform it, add some transparency in, just make these groups accountable. Where did that money come from? What is their interest in mind? So that when I see that ad, I can make up my own mind if I think that that was undue influence by that particular group, or at least yeah, I might want to do some extra checking. Right now, you have no way of knowing, I think. David? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with what Mike has said. The parties have been weakened because the money doesn't go to the parties anymore. So there isn't sort of the control that they had in years past. And it has moved to outside organizations and groups, and we're seeing the result of that. I don't like the idea that uh, donors are anonymous and that groups are anonymous. I think we got to find a way to bring the, the light, shine, the sunshine on that. Um, I think it was Oliver Wendell Holmes who said sunshine is the best disinfectant. I think that's important. And there is just, there is, it's very expensive. There's a lot of money. I think there's a, uh, in politics and it is a, a bigger part of the effort to stay in office and run for office. I don't know how you sort of fix that, but I think if the parties had more control and there was more disclosure and transparency, I think it would be certainly a, an improvement on the system that we've got now. I don't know how you get around the fact that you know dollars are speech, and the courts have ruled that pretty consistently. So I think the way to do it is to make sure we know who is funding what and in what amounts. Well, we, we know that anytime anybody fights Citizens United or anything like it, that people start bringing up emanations from the penumbra of the First Amendment, and, and, and there you go. So uh, that being the case, we know what's happening. We know how much dark money there is out there, and it's millions and millions and millions, perhaps billions. Uh, are there any things that, that we could do uh, to really control it, really bring it in, not, not uh, uh, fiddle around with Citizens United a little bit, but say, uh, uh, as the UK does, uh, limit the time an election, a campaign can take place. Limited campaigns to 90 days, uh, something uh, of, of that nature. Or absolutely, positively limit the amount of money that can be given to a campaign. And if you reach that level, no more money to the campaign. Or is that all just nonsense? And, and everything's got to be First Amendment. And uh, there will be no limits to anything, even as much as we'd like to see those limits. Michael? I think that's like fixing the carburetor with a hammer. I don't know if you'll ever get there in the, because it causes so much uh, political discontent along the way. I do think the first thing you can do is transparency. Make it transparent. I think that's the first fix that you can find bipartisan agreement. Hey, we need to make sure we understand who, who this is and where this money is coming from. I think if you start putting limits, you know, and our, our system is different than the UK system, as you know. This is a parliamentary system. You vote for slates. That 90-day thing kind of makes sense. We don't do that. We, we vote on an individual running for that office. And I think it would be really hard to try to stick it in that form of a, of a restricted time, time frame in the United States. But I do think the easy thing to do is transparency. Then you can have discussions later on. And I think the Supreme Court upheld the, the limits on individual contributions. So if you like those limits, that's one way to, to do that, to make sure about that. But then even that we had to fix because they had to go back and say we have to have a millionaire exemption because what if a millionaire runs? Now you're only raising $2,000 a throw and they can put in millions of dollars overnight. So you have to have a millionaire exemption. So I worry about trying, you get in there to tinker with it and you find more problems than you can, than you can fix. Don't get, don't get too cute is what you're saying. Yeah, yes, yeah. exactly. Okay, yeah. and I, I don't necessarily disagree with that. Dave, what do you think? Well, yeah, I think it's very hard to put time limits because if somebody has a job and they want to run for state rep and they can only work campaign on weekends, I mean, are you going to say they can only do it for 90 days? I, I just think there's a, a personal freedom issue there, and I, I think that's going to be hard in this country to adopt that. Obviously, they've, they've done that in other countries, and it seems to work. I just don't think that fits our background and our model here. So I, I, I would agree with much of what Mike has said. Would you agree that, that probably the best thing for the United States is just complete transparency? Yeah, I th especially in political dollars. If it's there to influence an election, I think we should have complete transparency of that dollar. Okay, great. How about a couple issues that uh, have both national and another one that has uh, a lot of state implications? Uh, the first would be the rather obvious in a lot of states, including Michigan, 
uh, gerrymandering of congressional district boundaries. Uh, and it has made a difference uh, in a lot of states. Michigan is a good example. Uh, President Obama won Michigan by half a million votes in 2000 and 2012, uh, but our congressional delegation is uh, nine Republicans and, and five Democrats, go figure. Uh, so uh, should, we, should we look at that? Should we do, uh, should we draw our congressional districts differently? Should we do a California uh, you know, a bipartisan uh, redistricting commission? Other states are starting to do it now, Arizona is. Iowa says they are, it's not such a hard, hardcore system, but should we be thinking of that when we look at, Florida's just doing it now too, in fact. Uh, should we think of some way to, uh, to non-gerrymander, or uh, better put, to draw our congressional district lines uh, to make the districts a little more competitive? Dave? Well, having represented a district that President Obama your, won. Your, dis your <laughs> district was no way you can gerrymander that <laughs> district. <laughs> President, Bill Clinton no way. Won, President Bill Clinton won twice. I never felt like it was just a gimme all the time. But, um, you know, Michigan actually has state laws that uh, really govern redistricting in a way that some other states don't have and that there's a limit on sort of the county breaks that you can have and they have zones of interest as well that the legislature has to take into account. And so as a result, if you look at a district map of Michigan, it, it isn't the sort of, you know, creative artwork that you see in some of these other states. So I, I don't know that in this particular state we have as much of a problem as you see around the rest of the country. Um, on that, um, and, and you know, also we're a swing state. I mean, you know, yeah, my view is if you aren't doing the job, except for me, you know, you're gonna not, you're not gonna be there. Um, so, you know, but I, I know other states are experimenting with. It. I, I, my, my concern is you're never gonna get the politics out of politics, and so this so-called nonpartisan commissions in these other states aren't necessarily free of political influence. So at least with the legislature, it. There's a vote in the legislature. There is some public accountability. The, the legislators face the voters themselves. I just think this sort of appointed board becomes um, more anonymous and in some ways less transparent and less accountable. But I do think the, 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 the protocols that have been established in Michigan have really resulted in um, you know, a, a pretty fair plan. Now, you know, as you certainly, when you try to make the districts exactly equal in population, you do get some, you know, very, um, on, the, on the margins, you get some, some problems there. But I think for the most part, we've got pretty good districts. Except the 14th in Michigan and the 5th in Florida. Take a look at those when you go home. Michael. Yeah. Yeah, well, and the, the one thing in the state system here is that it's about how many breaks in line. So they're trying to avoid that kind of creative salamander looking thing. Um, and I think that's a better system. And if you look at the states that are running into problems, they don't have any of those restrictions. I, I completely agree with Dave. Where they have done these so-called independent commissions, they are never independent commissions. I mean, how do you find anyone to serve on that commission that doesn't have a political objective? Good luck. I don't think you find it. So in at least a legislative body, if you put the right restrictions on about breaking lines, you can't separate certain populations, and that, which is a lot what we do here in Michigan, you get to a better map and it's more accountable. You mean, you know, politics is politics. If you're the Republicans in the state, you think it works great. If you're the Democrats right now, you think it's awful. I guarantee if that flipped, the, uh, we would feel it was awful and the Democrats would feel it was fine. But you, the one part of that is you have accountability in your legislator, legislature. And I worry that if you give that away to an independent commission, you've done more harm than you've done good. Yeah, I mean, one of the redistrictings I went through was drawn by a court. And I felt like there was very little accountability there. I mean, there was no ability to sort of, I mean, there was testimony and they had a trial and all of that, but the judge basically drew the lines. And I, I think that is a breakdown in the legislative process. So when you have that happen, I think you actually get a worse result. Yeah, I think it's gonna be an issue uh, for the next six, eight, 10 years to see how actually we draw these lines and we'll see where it goes. Uh, one final question before we take uh, questions from the audience. I want to talk for just a minute or two and ask both of you for just a minute or two about the U.S. military. How big should it be? How expensive should it be? Uh, should the Navy be bigger, have more ships? Should the Marine Corps be larger? Should the Army not be cut the way it's being cut 
right now, uh, and so forth and so on. I believe the number for FY16 was $602 billion, uh, which is a lot of money, obviously. But uh, what are the responsibilities of our military? <clears throat> we, uh, should we be thinking about boots on the ground in places uh, halfway around the world? Uh, should we be the go-to military for virtually every free country in the world? Uh, it's a question that the Congress is going to have to ask because there are only so many dollars out there. There's only so much in the way of resources and, and how big, how well equipped, how spread out worldwide should our military be? And you can give me the 20,000 foot answer to that one too. Well, you're an expert in this oh, more I than I am. I'm an expert. I mean, I have some strong opinions on it. One of the things that I think happens, uh, and I think we take this out of the equation, the U.S. military has been one of the most stabilizing forces in the world in our history. And when you start removing our ability to respond to places, uh, and, and I'm, as, I'm an old Army guy, uh, you, I believe that you have an Army so as you, hopefully you never have to use it. Uh, and as George Washington said, if you, if you want peace, prepare for war. Um, and we have somehow managed to lose that edge, or at least our adversaries don't believe we have that edge, and people will take advantage of it. And I think you see that happening around the world. I mean, we have readiness problems, which we should just not have because we've been robbing pay, uh, Peter to pay Paul. Readiness meaning if you have 10 aircraft, can all uh, 10 of them show up uh, and fly at the, when they need to fly, get where they need to go, and come back? Well, the answer is, candidly, no, not today. Do we have, we have 11 carrier groups. Can all 11 carrier groups steam up and get where they need to go and get back? The answer today is no. Um, and here's what I really worry about, about these arbitrary military size cuts, which sounds great. We're going to save all this money. We are wearing our military kids' families out. I mean wearing them out. So when you shrink, unless you're willing to say we are going to absolutely contract our ability to show up places in the world, you're going to ask them to do more. They'll have to do more. The deployment, the average deployment time and length is really astounding. Uh, and these kids, I'm telling you, we're wearing them out. You look what's doing their families. It's really quite troubling. And when you cut 40,000 people out of the United States Army, uh, and by the way, the, a week later, Russia announced 40,000 troops. I'm sure the number was coincidental. Going to the Arctic, right? They are sending a signal. They reacted to our signal. And what that means is those deployments get more frequent and more often with less people. I think that's a mistake. So the first thing we ought to do is stop all of that. We ought to make sure that we have deployment cycles that will at least allow these kids to be able to, and I say kids, a lot of them are in their 20s and they're married and they're, they have families, that they're not deployed on these long cycles for short periods. It used to be you go for 15 months, you would never have to get deployed again for another 15 months. That's gone. And they go for 10 months, back for three, back gone for 10. It's, it's, this is not healthy. And it's not right that we ask these people to do that. And so I, I believe you gotta get it, we gotta right size it, we've gotta upgrade our nuclear uh, arsenal, which we haven't done, we've, we've neglected that. Why is that important? Pakistan this next year will be the fourth largest holder of nuclear weapons. Iran is continuing its ballistic missile program. Russia has now, according to public reports, talking about uh, abandoning the INF, the Inter, uh, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, which is those short-term nuclear missiles. Big problem for all of us, including Europe. Uh, all of those things, we're going to have to step back and say, well, we, we're gonna have, we have to get, get ourselves back in shape militarily. Uh, and if you want to stop problems, I argue you have a good, robust military that's best trained, best equipped, can show up anywhere in the world. And by the way, can go two places at once because we're going to be engaged. You look at what China's expansionist activities have been, what Russia is up to. We're going to have to be in two places or at least show up. Uh, and right now, we're making it much more difficult for our military commanders to do that. And I think that's a big mistake that we'll pay a price for down the road. David? Well, I mean, that was a great answer. I would just add to that. I do think that we have not put enough pressure on some of our allies who have very robust, strong economies to to have their own militaries and not rely on the United States and therefore they zero out their military budgets and we're left as being the only nation. But clearly if the commitments are there, the resources as you very um, 
articulately stated need to be there for them. But I just, I just think, I mean, I, you know, Germany and Japan come to mind, and other countries that have really pulled back. They need to step up and and be a part of that solution as well. Can I give you a bit of good news on that front? You just mentioned Japan. Uh, I happen to be in a conference with uh, Japan and Australia on the rising Chinese aggression in the South China Sea and the Pacific Rim. And Japan is changing their constitution. It's caused a bit of a political turmoil there to in allow them to engage in overseas activities, meaning patrols and other things. That is really critically important. And to that end, we'll help our financial commitments there. They'll be able to offset a lot of our costs uh, in policing. Remember, we did that to them, right? We told them to do it. They did it. They adopted it as a political philosophy. We ought to encourage them to do this. That helps with yeah. that equation that Dave was yeah. talking about. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah. And the Australians as well. Yes. Well, whether it's uh, the Middle East and the Arctic or the Spratleys and the Paracels in, in the South China Sea, uh, we really do need our military. And uh, I, and I'm happy to see that Mike and David uh, are concerned about what's being done, which I believe is short-sighted. Doesn't make us war warmongers, just makes us very, very careful Americans that we want to be able to defend ourselves and also help defend and fight with our allies when, when we need to. Uh, so with that, uh, John, want to start the questions? Yes. Um, so. Hello, Congressman Rogers, uh, Schwartz and Camp. Thank you very much for being here and talking to us today. Oh. Can you hear us now? There we go. Okay. Uh, so my name is Tree Sempe, and I am a first-year MPP student and a lifetime resident of Michigan. So thank you very much for your service to our great state. Our first question today is, as surveillance technology becomes more pervasive, what are your thoughts about the trade-offs between privacy and security for American citizens? Uh, <laughs> oh, look at the time. <laughs> I think this is gonna be one of the biggest issues we face moving forward here about how we look at our national security vis-a-vis -vis the explosion of technology in our lives. Um, and I think that you, you don't have to have an either or. I don't even buy the conversation that you have to sacrifice a little of one to get a little more of the other and you just have to you know, suck it up. I don't buy that at all. And I don't think that's an accurate portrayal of the protections that we have in place and the technology that exists. Here's the problem. Can, if you, and this has always been my pet peeve, and of course as chairman of the Intelligence Committee, we got all of that, lived through the NSA contractor leak uh, events, it's a year of my life I'd like back, by the way. Um, and what we found was, was, this is fascinating, what people believed our government was doing is based on their connection to technology of what the, a, a private sector company is doing, right? The amount of information that the private sector, a company like Google or Amazon or others, collects on you every single day is staggering, right? And I always say that a good offense, this will get me in big trouble, so I'm, but I'm not elected anymore, so I can say this. <laughs> um, a good offense is a good defense. The amount of, and, and they're coming out and saying, we're, we're the only ones for privacy and we're not even gonna answer a, a legal warrant from the National Security Agency or the FBI after it's gone to a judge and been adjudicated, issued a warrant, they're not even gonna respond to it because they care about your privacy. Have you ever stopped and thought why they do that? Why would they basically say we're not going to uh, uh, abide by a legal warrant from a federal judge on a terrorism case? Why? Because they're collecting more stuff on, they know more about you than you can possibly ever imagine. By the way, the NSA would dream to have a database like that. And so we're going to have to shake ourselves out of this in a real hurry. We are, we are, the United States is in a cyber war. Most Americans don't know it. And by the way, we're not winning. 85% of the networks in America are private sector networks. They are getting killed. They're getting killed by Chinese economic espionage. Now the Russians have changed their plan. We found them on our financial markets, again, according to public reports. Recently, people are asking why would they be there? Crash the markets, maybe? I don't want to find out. Anybody in here want to find out? Right? We are losing this fight because we can't get over this privacy versus security hangover. And uh, candidly, and I've told this and I'm not telling a tale out of school. I've talked to Google and Amazon and others and said, you're, you're killing your position here, uh, but we got to get out of this in a hurry. You can do both. You can have both. Uh, but the longer this goes, the worse we're going to be. 
and they're finding new ways. Let me tell you how bad it is, just real quick, as an example. A, a concrete example, you can kind of go, yep, if that, that must be bad. So now they've figured out ways, uh, they being nation states uh, and intelligence services, to get into our uplinks on our satellites. So, or, and downlinks. So everybody has the app to get to the Starbucks, right? Imagine if that didn't work during the day, huh? At about four or five in the morning when you're needing a little caffeine. Well, imagine our technological advantage in the world is technology. One sixth of our economy is tied to a commercial internet, right? This is something we should protect. This is something we should be concerned about. Well, they got into those uplinks and imagine all of our smart weapons, one of our strategic advantages in the world, we have really smart weapons. Well, what if that carrier group doesn't know where it's at located in the world and its missile systems don't know where it's at or where they're pointed? We have a big problem, right? So here's what the Navy decided they're gonna do. They have a new piece of technology to try to deal with what is a real possibility that, that those uh, uh, uplinks and downlinks get hacked, right? Remember, they've already given up on the fact that your private networks are getting hacked. The Russians, the Iranians, the Chinese, they're on your private networks. Got bad news for you. So what, are the, what is the Navy doing? Every new naval officer that graduates by 2017 has to be trained in a sextant. Oh, I wish I were kidding. It was designed by uh, Sir Isaac Newton, right? Put in place in about 1727 as the premier geo or you know, global navigation tool. And they're so worried about this problem. They're teaching officers. They haven't used this thing in, I don't know, decades. But they realized what happens if they're successful. So if the United States Navy is worried about hacking, shouldn't we be worried about hacking? Right? And most Americans just aren't worried about it. And I think they're worried about the NSA when they really should be worried about the Russians, the Iranians, and the Chinese who are on our networks. Uh, the NSA is not on our networks. Or if they are, they're doing it illegally. And so I, I am passionate about this because I'm very worried about the state of our A, ability to defend ourselves. Remember there's a report about five years ago now uh, that had the Chinese uh, had code on our electric grids. Now, they weren't there to flip the switch. We think they're rational actors. But why were they there? It's called prepping the battlefield. If they wanted to invade Taiwan, what's the best way to keep us distracted? Turn off the lights on the eastern seaboard. They had the capability. That was a public report. It's called the Mandiant Report, for anyone's interested. And if you're, if you're a techie, I highly recommend you read it. It's really good and scary. And you'll stay up all night. My argument is if I can't sleep at night, why should you, by the way? <laughs> So I, I think we've got to kind of get ourselves off of this hangover about what we think is happening versus what is happening. And if we get there, you can have security and you can have privacy. David? Well, I think maybe we want to go to another question because that was a pretty complete Sorry, answer. No, I mean, it was very good. I Okay, John. Yep. Thank you all for, for coming today. Uh, my name is John Lynn. I'm a fourth year in the Law and Public Policy program here, and I'm a lifelong Michigander um, with an interest in public service. Um, this question asks whether you can talk about the internal politics of the House Republican Conference. Um, specifically, it asks about the so-called Hassert Rule and whether or not it is actually applied or should, or should be applied um, in internal caucus conference deliberations. Yeah, the Hastert rule was that uh, nothing would come to the floor that didn't at least have a majority of the majority. So uh, it, was a, it, was, it was a way of sort of making sure there was some consensus. Um, clearly that has not been the case um, on some of the big issues in terms of you know, raising the debt limit um, and other very controversial items. Um, I don't know that uh, the new speaker is going to subscribe to that rule. It's an informal rule. It's not really a house rule. So it's something that they that really came in uh, really when Speaker Hastert uh, took the speakership. But um, I, I think what um, is important is um, the house is really sort of a winner take all. And um, at some point, you know, as, as Mike said earlier, it, you know, even in the Congress, it's a coalition. And there are different views within the Republican majority. And at some point, you have to decide, um, are you going to govern with that majority or not? And that means that you're not going to necessarily get your way all the time. But yet, if you aren't the majority, then who is? And so um, I, I think that what you're going to see, um, hopefully going forward, is their attempt to build consensus. You saw this highway bill, as Debbie can probably say, um, 
just how many hundreds of votes there were on that bill on the House floor. Um, so I think there's an attempt to really build consensus in a way that had not been the case uh, previously. And I think that's it's the only way they're going to be able to manage it um, because um, you're just not going to be able to do it in the way that it was being done in the past where either deals were uh, sort of done and then presented to the Congress or very few amendments were allowed. Um, you really do want the Congress to work its will and to the extent that you can do that and you're not operating with your back up against the wall on a deadline, so. In 2012, the VA estimated that 22 veterans commit suicide every day. What role should policymakers play and what precisely should be done to solve this pressing issue? Yeah, uh, there's been some great efforts, I think, to get after it. They've just been slow. Uh, and slow to get there. And part of the problem was an overwhelming uh, number came back at a time that I don't think that they were configured correctly, they being the VA, to try to handle it. Uh, nor was there an effort to really focus on mental health issues when they came back. And so what they're finding, by the way, is some of those cases were, were they had problems before they went. And so one of the things that they're doing now, which I think is, is great, is trying to identify those problems before they go, or in some cases say, maybe if you fit this certain mental health issue profile, maybe we're gonna find something else for you to do uh, in a way to try to help them through their problems. So it's not, if you can't look at it with, without a holistic approach. Uh, and then the folks that come back, what they've done now, and it's, it's probably still not completely enough, is try to catch them before they go out and give them the opportunity to get connected and take away the stigma of mental health counseling. You know, some people need a very little bit of it, but they need a little bit of it. Uh, and some people will need more long, longer duration uh, treatment and care and, and access to mental health care. And so we're, I think the VA is probably still working through all of that, but I, th I think that at least now I feel a little better as a former veteran myself, that they're, they've got this notion about identifying problems early, identifying problems while you're there, and then giving them the opportunity and taking away the stigma when you get home. The folks that you see now, unfortunately, didn't get that kind of care. So we're try they're trying to catch up on the people that you see, unfortunately, uh, taking their own lives, which we need to stop. Yeah, there's a new clinic, <coughs> relatively new clinic at Bethesda that I had an opportunity to tour just before I left office, and it is actually dedicated to this exact problem, and they bring uh, veterans in for intense therapy and intense counseling, and uh, it, it, it di didn't happen right away. I mean, this is something that uh, certainly has been recognized. The entire issue of mental health never gets enough attention. It's um, and certainly mental health issues with veterans. Uh, you know, in years ago, I remember beginning work on PTSD, and it was sort of a you know a, this new area of understanding. But um, there clearly is a huge need there. Um, they've made some some real progress, uh, at least in terms of trying to identify uh, those veterans who are returning who need that assistance. And it really is a condition that needs treatment. And um, just as uh, there's certainly a lot of physical treatment that needs to occur with many veterans that are returning, there's certainly a lot of mental health treatment as well. It's very a, impressed uh, with the people in that clinic and the work they were doing. As a uh, member of the uh, investigatory group that was appointed uh, by Secretary of Defense Robert Gates to look into uh, the situation in the military hospitals, uh, as to whether reasonably and appropriate mental health care was being, was being given. This is especially so at Walter Reed, the old Walter Reed. Walter Reed now is on the Bethesda grounds, as you know. Uh, it was a problem then, which was eight years ago. It is still a huge problem. And uh, I can only wish, I can't do anything about it, but I can only wish as a physician and as a veteran uh, that as much emphasis as possible is put, and, and as much, uh, let's put it this way, appropriation should be appropriate uh, to take care of the mental health needs of uh, our active duty service people and, and those who have left the service but still have a tremendous number of stigmata, PTSD, 
uh, traumatic brain injury, et cetera. And there's a lot of work to be done. So this next question comes to us from Twitter. Um, as, public service, as public servants from Michigan and then in Washington, what was the most memorable aspect of your leap from state politics in Lansing to national politics in DC? Just the size and scope, I think. It's sort of like uh, trying to take a sip of water out of an open fire hydrant. Um, in, in that sense, it's also very rewarding and enriching because so much is coming at you, but that's also the biggest challenge you face, is just the array of issues, um, concerns, problems. Uh, the scope is, is huge, but that, um, that also means that uh, the days go by very, very quickly. <laughs> Um, when will we see the next iteration of the camp tax reform plan? What are the most likely changes in the next version? Well, the, the tax reform proposals really shifted to some of the presidential candidates. And I think it's really exciting to see the number of detailed plans that have been put out there already. I mean, t mine was a legislative document, and obviously these are campaign documents. But uh, a number of them are you know, surprising in their detail. So I think you're gonna see the shift there. I know that the new chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, Kevin Brady of Texas, I've talked to him, he is gonna to continue to work on this effort. Um, I know that new speaker Paul Ryan wants to continue to see this effort. So I think you'll see some um, continued work done on the committee level as well and in the Congress um, and certainly in the Senate. I know that Senator Hatch is also, uh, and there's these bipartisan groups he's working with over there. But, um, and I don't think we've seen the end of it. And I, I think part of the reason tax reform is really being presented is, you know, there is this tremendous unhappiness with what is going on in the country and in co particularly Congress's lack of response. And I, I think part of it is the fact that we haven't seen the kind of recovery we want to see. I mean, still way too many people have left the workforce. Median incomes have been declining since 2008 or flat. And um, you know it's very hard for people to get a job and get started, or if they lose a job, to find employment again. Some of that's being voiced through this issue of um, you know certain income inequality. Others are talking about you know how we need job creation. One way, not the only way, but one way to do it is through pro-growth tax reform that could actually grow our economy and create jobs. And I think you're going to continue to see this be one of the key issues in this election, because I think the economy is going to be one of the big issues. I think this is going to be an economy jobs election. I could be wrong, but, and I think one way to address it is to deal with, with our, our out of date. Look, everybody knows it's broken. We need to fix it. And I think that you're going to see more ideas uh, on how to do that. And if that becomes one of the key issues in, in this presidential campaign, then you'll have somebody elected who really thinks that this is something that ought to be one of their top two or three issues. And the concern is if we don't do it, we're gonna to continue to see our tax base erode as companies are merged and become Irish-based companies or um, companies located around the world. Even though they'll have pr some presence here, the growth will be in other places. So. Um, it's encouraging. Uh, they're in different approaches. Some are sort of doing this lower rate, broader base approach. Others are doing more of a, of a consumption or fair tax approach. So there's actually different structures that are going to be debated, I think, hopefully in more detail. Tonight there's a, there's a Republican debate on, on a business channel. So maybe we'll actually have a question about the economy um, and what solutions candidates might offer. That would certainly be novel. Um, <laughs> so we'll see. So this question could take some time, but um, the consensus is that Congress is, quote, broken. How did we get here, and what can we do to fix it? Well, if I had an answer, maybe I'd be speaker, but um, no. I, think, I think that issues have to be developed, and I think they got to get back to work, and they got to propose things that, you know, you might think that it's going to cause some controversy, but you got to step up and do it. I mean, I had senators call me and say, oh, don't put out a detailed bill. Everyone's going to be, you know, about all the things that you addressed. But what I, my, the response I got was, at least you're trying to do something. So I think it's done through you know, ideas coming to the Congress from voters, from people, uh, and, and then 
you know, vetting those through the hearings and the committees. It's not glamorous work, but it's the work that, that legislators do, get back to that, and then actually have, have ways to bring them to the floor. Not wait and just operate crisis by crisis, uh, where it's, let's just, you know, make sure we fund the government for the next year at the last minute, or let's, you know, address this debt ceiling problem, but let's try to find ways of, of addressing these through that vehicle. And I think if we do that and cast the votes and they, they cast the votes out there, I think that, well, yeah, it, it may cause some controversy, but I think people wanna hear you explain why then you, you did that. And if you can justify it and give a good reason, my experience over 12 terms in Congress was that they still may not vote for you, but they'll accept that you're actually trying to do something and you have a sincere, legitimate point of view. So I think I, I would agree and Paul Ryan probably said it the best way. We need to start proposing things and we need to find out what people think works. And I can tell you when you put an idea out there as I did with HR1, you certainly find out about all the people who don't like what your proposal was. But that's a very valuable part of the process and then you can change it and try to find a political consensus to move it forward. Yeah, and my whole thing is I, there's this uh, class of kind of celebrity politicians that get in. I, I don't think they're there for the right reason. Being a legislator isn't the glamorous. If you want to be uh, famous and be that, that guy that's going to change X or Y, not likely you're going to do it in a body of 435 people. You have to go and sit down and meet with people you don't agree with. That part of Congress got broken somewhere over the last, I don't know, 10 years really. Yeah. And, we got to get back to that. And we're, we're going to, here's the sad part. You're all, this is really the most depressing thing I'm going to tell you all day. Are you ready? <laughs> Congress is a lot like America, right? We are sending those people there and they're acting, they're reflecting their districts in a pretty important way. And we lose sight of that sometimes. And so that dysfunction is exactly where voters are all across America. They're frustrated about different things for different reasons. And we're not telling legislators, go and try to bridge the differences. We're telling them, go up there and fight and stand your ground and don't agree to anything. Right? That's what I want in a member of Congress. Well, if you want that, you get what you get. Right? That's what you get. You get a place that does not function. So I think it's a combination of voters realizing this is a legislative body that legislates. Uh, and you're not going to get everything you want. I argue you can move the ball in your direction. If you're a good negotiator, you're good, you sit down and you can work with people. You can get what you you can get where you want to go. It takes a long time to get there, so we're going to have to do I think on both ends of that and try to get the place functioning again, as Dave said, through the committee process, have the hearings. Like I said, it can be sometimes absolutely horrifically monotonous. Imagine a Ways and Means Committee for eight hours on the tax code. God bless you, sir. <laughs> I, I don't know if I could have done it. Well, when, when I put the bill out, we had, we went, I went through it line by line with Republicans and Democrats on the committee. It took two weeks. It was excruciating, but we did it. But that's the kind of thing you have, to, you do. have to do. Yeah, you absolutely do. And, and look, there, we know there are fundamental differences in the approach. I mean, we've never resolved as a country how much money the government should have and how much it should spend and how it should spend it. I mean, so there's, and on what? Yeah, I mean, so there's a legitimate difference of opinion. There's a group of people, very sincere, who believe the government doesn't spend enough and do enough and invest in human capital and things. And there's a, a, a group feel just as strongly that think, you know, our debt is gonna you know, bankrupt this country and if we don't start scaling back now, you know, the world is gonna end. So, we, and, and I often say to people, Try raising some of these issues at a family reunion and just see how far you get. I know my family, we don't get consensus, trust me. But so there, there are, but given that, if you, if you continue to work at it, you've got to find a, a way forward. And I know it, it isn't in fashion, but ultimately these issues are resolved in America by compromise. And that does mean you don't get everything you want. And I think that is really where we have to ultimately end up. And it's not an easy thing to do because you'll have a whole bunch of people who say, why did you give away the store on whatever issue it is? What are popular misconceptions about your former job? What should voters know about the legislation that they do not? I think the biggest 
misconception to me is the fact that every member of Congress is a self-serving, you know, felon. <laughs> um, I just, I never quite saw that. I mean, there's bad people in everything, but I, the most people I met, even the ones I passionately, angrily disagreed with, I always thought were there for, for what they believed was the right decision. Um, so I think to me that is the biggest misconception. And given the, the voters' opportunity to let people do their work uh, and have some disagreements, I, I think the place would be a much better, much better place. And again, the people who are doing it, I mean, these are not, the, the, the brutality of going through an election is pretty, pretty awful experience. And really everyone should experience it, at least. <laughs> um, it's just a brutal thing and, and members do it constantly. And, and I, I just, I think the, the view of what the average member of Congress or who that person is, is completely distorted. Because they're, they're basing it on the one congressman they see on TV that they don't like. That's not everybody that's there. There's a lot of people sitting there, probably right now, you know, Debbie Dingell's not here, is, was one of them, is always trying to put people in a room to try to get something done. Great. And that doesn't make the news. That's not on the cable outlets. That's not on CBS News. And I think that misconception is probably harmful, equally as harmful, or at least contributing harmful to the fact that People have a, they don't like the people who are there, they think on general, they don't trust them, don't like them, and they don't do anything, and then it's dysfunctional, and then like, why do I care? Well, like, well, I forget it, I'm not getting engaged. I think that cycle, we have to break that cycle, but I think that's, to me, is the biggest misperception about members of Congress and what happens there. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I would just say that, um, I've run into some of the, my colleagues that I used to serve with, and I, I, I've been saying to them, you know, you're actually working a lot harder than you realize, uh, and you don't realize the effort until, it's, until you stop. I mean, to do the job right is really a challenge, certainly very rewarding, um, but it isn't all about, um, you know, getting that award in front of a, a group of people applauding. Sometimes it's that delayed flight um, that you've had for the third week in a row, um, and you know, mi missing some important family event because you're still there voting when you thought you'd be out. And so there, there are a lot of challenges. I think the, probably the biggest misconception is just the um, sort of multiple pressures and dealing with that on, a, on an ongoing basis. It's so important to have the, the support of people that you represent. And I felt, always felt very fortunate in the 4th District that people, I'd come back and always feel really invigorated every weekend when I came home and then I was able to go back in and you know, fight for them when I was in these meetings and, you know, uh, so I think that part, just sort of the, the being stretched, you always sort of had this feeling that you were never in the right place. Like when I was in Washington, I always felt like I should be in Michigan. When I was in Michigan, I always felt like I should be in, you know, Washington doing my work. So one of the, th the things I've noticed about leaving is I, wherever I am, I am in the right place now. So, I mean, that, I think that's probably the, one of the biggest challenges you face, is you, the sense of you're never quite giving enough time or you're never quite there enough because you've got to go on to the next thing. There are some superb people in Congress. They, uh, they work hard. They don't care if their names ever get in the newspaper. They do their jobs. They represent their districts wherever those districts may be. And uh, I would say that's a majority of the members of the U.S. House, as opposed to a, a small plurality. Uh, the media gets involved, an issue gets out there that gets people on edge, and Congress gets a black eye. And sometimes Congress deserves a black eye, but I think if, if on this question, and what Dave and Mike have said, and what I would like to chime in on, is there are a lot of awful good members of Congress who work awfully hard and really don't care if they ever get their name in the newspaper. They're just, they're just doing their job. Uh, there aren't as many as there used to be, but there are plenty of really good folks down there. There's a couple of bad ones. They're in the federal penitentiary. That's how we know that. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about them. I, I ran into one who went to the federal, I won't mention his name. I ran into one who went to the federal penitentiary in, the, in an airport, uh, actually in Newark, New Jersey, about, about two years ago. And I was talking to the guy and uh, and I was talking to the people behind me, and the guy goes, how do you know all that? And I said, well, you know, I, one time where I was a member of Congress, and this guy in front of me turns around and says, well, I was a member of Congress once. And I looked at him, and I said, uh, do I know you when we were there? And he told me it was the same time I was there. It was Bob Ney. <laughs> he continued his federal service. He did continue his federal service. 
but I didn't recognize him because he'd lost about 70 pounds. <laughs> but Mike, you're right. Occasionally, somebody sneaks off into the, the federal uh, uh, the correctional system. Not too many, though. <laughs> Um, so would either of you consider re-entering public service or is that, is that part of your past life? No for me. Uh, it's dependent. Yeah, I mean I wouldn't. Younger uh, than I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would consider it under the right circumstances. So this is the last question we have time for. Um, so for many of us in, in this generation, public service is seen as kind of a thankless job. It's not really a career you think, yes, I want to, most of us. Um, so what would you say to kind of inspire our generation to say, you know, this, this is really a career that is, is wonderful to be in? <laughs> Some of us think it is wonderful. Public service or this career? Well, public Elected. service is general, being a congressman oh, in your office. Well, first of all, I'd say go volunteer on a campaign to sort of get a sense of it. And, and there are nonpartisan, if you don't know which party you're in, uh, try a nonpartisan race. My first race was helping one of my partners run for judge and in Michigan they're nonpartisan and you know, I, I learned a lot and saw some things. So I would just say try things as a volunteer. Um, and, and then um, I think it's incredibly rewarding. Um, I mean, first of all, you have an opportunity to impact people in a very positive way. And, and even in a campaign sense, I mean, people who selflessly come up and help you put your yard signs out or donate to your campaign or come to your hot dog roast or whatever um, and, and certainly vote for you, it's, it's, it's pretty humbling. And, and then you have an opportunity to really be um, involved in issues of the day. And, and obviously in Congress, some of it's constituent service and you can... Sometimes people would come to me completely exasperated, couldn't get anything done, and I was able to help them resolve their issue. You can't fix them all, and I always would, I would always say I, I can't promise a result, but I'll, I promise you I'll work as hard as I can to fix it. So there are some times when you can really help families. And sometimes it's as much as there's a wedding in another country and they forgot they needed passports and it's in two days. And, and sometimes it's things of that nature that aren't necessarily um, life would still go on, but they're pretty important at the time. Uh, others are, are more critical in terms of having someone make sure they're, they're, they're getting the benefit that they deserve and things of that kind. But I, I think it's incredibly rewarding. I would recommend to anybody to certainly take a look at it and maybe intern in an office or volunteer in an office and just see if it's something that might fit with your um, personality. Um, and it's a challenge to master the issues. It's a challenge to keep up on everything. And I think it's an inc in, in, incredibly, it's an incredible experience. Um, and I would recommend it to really anybody. It doesn't mean there aren't moments, but you know, every job has its downsides. And I always say, whatever job you have, find the positives and focus on them. And there are many positives, obviously, in public service. Uh, you know, I, I was in public service for 27 years before I got out with my army and FBI. I look at all of that as the same kind of public service. And the one thing that struck me in all that, and I'll tell a very quick story if I may, uh, because it, it, to me, it, it, I found this particular story impactful on every public service job that I had. And there are other ways. You don't have to be the congressman to be involved in public service or politics and have an impact, first of all. I think that's really important. You don't have to be that guy. You can be, staff have an incredibly important role, involved in campaigns, important role. When I was a young FBI agent, there was a, uh, and I, I'll, I'll cut the story down, but there was a young lady who ran away from home. Uh, she gets to Chicago. I was working the organized crime squad at the time. Uh, sophomore, or excuse me, junior in high school. She runs away, uh, gets there. Uh, they have spotters at the air, at the bus stops, right? And so they get her. She's a uh, you know young, attractive young lady. Uh, they bring her into their fold. They take her around and kind of socialize her in the city, saying, "Isn't this great? It's a great way of life." Oh, by the way, everybody's doing drugs. You need to do some drugs. Uh, and over about the period of 40 days, got her as a stone cold heroin junkie, right? In 40 days, and a, a mother called and and talked to. Uh, uh, an agent, happened to be me, and said, I think my daughter is in this certain place, but I, 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 they, it's not a federal crime, it's a runaway, as you know. Uh, so I thought, on my own time, I'm going to go do this. Fast forward a few years, so the organized crime had gotten this young lady, put her, got her hooked on heroin, got her with a, or a, a pimp. Uh, that pimp had a, a 
a corral of girls that he would bring to these houses of prostitution at night, protected by the police uh, in a town outside of uh, Chicago called Cicero, Illinois. We, yeah, Cicero, Illinois. So we finally get her out, uh, fast forward, get her out, and she's in that car, and we had some counselors on the other end, but we had to drive them there uh, to get there, and I had, and never forget this. So she gets out, she had track marks in her fingers, she had track marks under her arms. I mean, this, she was a mess. Uh, and she had only been there for probably a little less than two years. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, really sad story. So she gets in the car, dead quiet, and she's not under arrest. We're trying to get her help. And she's just staring out the window, and I was chatting with my, uh, my, the fellow agent. And out of the blue, in this little quiet voice, she said, do you know why I didn't kill myself? Because I knew somebody cared enough to show up. Somebody cared enough to find me and get me out. And I thought, I don't care what public service job you have, if it has an element of that, and I don't know a public service job that doesn't have an element of that, that you have to care more than the person sitting next to you about somebody who's probably been abandoned or neglected or the whole world thinks that, or they think the whole world has forgotten about them. That, to me, epitomizes what public service is. Um, you can do it for a, a year or two years. You can volunteer. You can make it a career. Uh, I think there are people's lives that you touch that you'll never know, you'll never get to know in a public service job that has that kind of impact. So I argue everybody ought to have that, at least the opportunity in their life to find some public service activity. And again, it doesn't have to be full time. You can even volunteer, but you will impact a life like that. And if everybody did that in the country, I think we'd be a hell of a lot better place. And uh, we'd, I think, be a little kinder to each other along the way. Amen to that, Mike. So, David and Michael, good friends, uh, just utterly superb and distinguished public servants. Thank you for coming to the Ford School. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on a number of issues with us this afternoon. Uh, all the best to you in the future. Thank all of you for coming, and go blue. Thanks.